afternoon. As you've just heard, my name is Beatrice Sainuk Ackerman, and uh, I got my job through nepotism. For 10 years, I had the privilege of working with one of the world's most accomplished engineers, my father, Israel Sainuk. When the news came that he had been designated the recipient of the uh, Fazlur Rahman Khan Medal, my father, who had received over 25 uh, personal and 80 project awards, was especially excited and, and very honored. He very much looked forward to speaking before you today. Uh, and although I must say that the prospect of speaking um, in his stead is a bit unnerving, I know that in some way he is, he is here in spirit, certainly in my heart. And so I will try to honor him properly. Uh, Israel Sena grew up in a very poor neighborhood called Luyano in Havana, Cuba, to parents who had emigrated there from Europe around the time of World War I. Always precocious, outspoken, and bright, he eventually chose to study civil engineering. And although it would seem to most of us to be a very safe career choice, uh, there were some perils. You see, Every freshman, uh, at, every freshman engineering student at the University of Havana would be uh, chased down, it was a hallowed tradition, would be chased down and have his hair shaved off by upperclassmen. No matter what you did to hide, um, whoops, going the wrong way, sorry. No matter what you did to hide, they would chase you down uh, and, and, and cut your hair. Uh, so with a wry sense of humor that was typical of my dad and a conviction never to lose control of a situation, he made his appointment with the would-be barbers, bringing along a photographer to record the fun. And that was always his way. You go with the challenges and you have fun in the process. Yes, I have to go the other way. Um, he began his career as a rookie engineer. I'm sorry. We're, we're, bear with me, I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. He began his career as a rookie engineer uh, at the engineering office of Luis Sanz, where he worked on a 39 story building by the name of Edificio Libertad, uh, folks, I'm sorry, considered one of the marvels of Cuban engineering. Uh, at the time, construction began in February of 1954, uh, and it was built in record time, just 28 months. It was completed in June of 1956. So at 397 feet, it was the second tallest concrete building in the world when it was completed. What he learned from working on this building would serve him well throughout his entire career. Early on, my dad was assigned to work as a designer and project liaison for the new Havana Riviera Hotel. During the course of this project, Louis Sands merged his company with an architectural firm. Israel, unwilling to be limited to a single architectural aesthetic, left the firm and accepted a position of owner's rep for the developers of the Riviera Hotel. Um, and throughout his career, he always loved the variety of challenges that came with working with different architectural points of view. He, he began his private practice in 1958 by designing the 700-room Monte Carlo Hotel in Havana for some rather colorful characters. As he told the story, he was called into a dimly lit office where he was received by two businessmen, one sitting behind the desk and one in the chair next to where he would be sitting. In the corner sat an old man in a rocking chair swaying gently as he looked out the window, apparently oblivious to the conversation that was going on in the room. The man behind the desk was a little bit irritated. He was none too pleased that the fee suggested by this young upstart was uh, higher than any of the competitors. So he was impatiently questioning Israel. And in the, in the words that I've heard him use many times um, when he spoke with clients over the years, he said, OK, I have a better idea. I'll do the project for free. 
My fee will be based on a percentage of the savings my design will produce in construction and material costs. The momentary silence that ensued was broken by a voice coming from the rocking chair saying, give the kid the job. <laughs> Working with such colorful characters meant that project meetings were held at unusual hours at equally colorful uh, locations exactly the Sans Souci nightclub after the uh, second show at 2 o'clock in the morning. And attendance, as you can imagine, was mandatory. Through the FOXA project, Israel met the renowned Spanish architect Martin Dominguez. Dominguez was impressed by this young Dominguez was impressed by this young engineer's talent, and um, he awarded him an amazing project for any engineer at the time, at, let alone such a young one. Uh, and he got to complete the design of the 50-story Edificio Libertad, a residential building that had, not, had it not been for the Castro Revolution, would most, most certainly have been completed and become a modernist icon in the, in the Cuban skyline. He also completed the design of another 50-story building that would stand on four mega columns over an existing movie theater. It was for this building that he first advanced the concept of the mega structure that he finally put into use many years later. The high concrete strength that made these designs possible was not being used in New York at the time, and his experience with these buildings was instrumental in his subsequent ability to pioneer its use in New York. He was influential in promoting the changes in the New York City code and his enthusiastic encouragement of the use of ever higher strengths of concrete eventually led Concretist Magazine to refer to him as the concrete guru. Israel's promising private practice was cut short by the Fidel Castro revolution. Government decrees put a dead halt to all private construction and severely curtailed private business. So in 1959, by the request of the Minister of Public Works, he organized and headed the structural department and became responsible for all its designs as well as publication of standards for the ministry. He also, by competition, became assistant professor of structures at his alma mater, uh, the University of Havana. It soon became apparent, however, that he would have to leave Cuba before the curtailment of liberties and the deteriorating quality of life worsened. How he was able to get out of Cuba is a story that would make a great movie, but suffice it to say that he did get out. The young Professor Sainuk arrived in New York with a wife and two small children in September of 1960. All he had was his slide rule his diploma from the University of Havana, and $20, which was all the money the Cuban government would allow him to leave with. In New York, he was hired by the firm of Abrams, Hertzberg, and Cantor, where he quickly rose to become a, a chief structural engineer and associate. In 1970, he became a partner in the company, then called the office of Erwin G. Cantor. In 1992, the firm was renamed the Cantor Sainuk Group PC with Israel Sainuk as its CEO, and in the summer of 2000, the firm was bought by a UK firm. 34 years ago, in 1976, Professor Sainuk also established Israel A. Sainuk PC, referred to as YAS, an MBE firm, and it has enjoyed steady growth over the years and today possesses an impressive project portfolio and a talented staff handpicked and intensively trained by Israel himself. The teamwork at what we call the YAS family brought a great deal of pride to my dad and enabled the firm to produce many notable and award-winning projects, both public and private. He accumulated an extensive portfolio of projects of, uh, of all types, uh, but he's best known for his high-rise work, of which I will present a sampling. Park Lane North and South um, are two buildings that are a perfect example of an engineer who is, in, in his own words, 
said, my work has always been about stretching the horizon. In other words, telling him, no, you can't do that here, would just get him fired up for the challenge. So in 1973, one of the few air rights projects in New York had been abandoned because finding a practical and cost-effective uh, method of construction was elusive. The most practical solution meant bringing in technologies that were just not acceptable in New York City at the time. The design combined precast, pre-stressed box beams, box and T-beams, post-tension wall beams, and cast-in-place concrete. The project demonstrated how the use of economical post-tension construction could realistically support a building over a large open span, in this case 66 feet over railroad lines without ever interrupting traffic. The Sainuk reputation was built on challenging the status quo. Current engineers may not find some of these techniques very impressive, but pushing the limits in his time helped create the foundation for today's innovations. Trump Tower was certainly one of the most hyped and anticipated buildings of its time. Located on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 57th Street in New York City, the 664-foot structure is a mixed-use building consisting of 38 stories of prestigious residential apartments above 14 stories of offices. Um, below the offices is a monumental seven-story atrium and retail center. A reinforced concrete structural solution was chosen for the building in lieu of an alternative structural steel concept because it could meet the demand for speedy construction as well as better interpretation of the um, architectural intent. The Lipstick Building, uh, 383 Third Avenue, was one of Israel's collaborations with Philip Johnson, who he had actually met back when he was working on the Monte Carlo Hotel in Havana. It was one of only two elliptical buildings in the country at the time, and the engineering solutions to the many challenges created a building that is still today a visual icon of New York City. 450 Lexington Avenue was an extremely complex project entailing the construction of a 40-story office building above and through an existing six-story landmark uh, post office, the, the Grand Central Post Office. Since just the facade had landmark status, Israel suggested keeping only the facade intact. The entire base of the post office was traversed also with train tracks leading to Grand Central Terminal, and so this was the perfect project for the use of the mega structure that he envisioned back in Cuba. The structural solution resulted in the construction of a composite concrete and steel megastructure having the ability to span the railroad tracks and support the new office building. The interior of the post office was gutted, making way for the new mega system, while the landmark facade was left in, in place around the new structure. The new foundations made use of existing steel and concrete structures, avoiding their removal and enabling the construction to proceed while the post office building above was in place. My father once took my son on a trip to Italy and was showing him a particular arch explaining how it was designed and built. My son asked him, well, how do you know that? Because I was there, he said. Maybe that's why he was inspired, or that's what inspired him, to meet the challenge of the award-winning Rockefeller University building over the FDR Drive. The original plan of steel plate girders designed to bridge the highway was difficult and expensive to erect. Spanning six lines, lanes of the FDR Drive, the Rockefeller University Research Building now rises from a funicular, segmented arch supported on two V-shaped columns on the edge of the river. These columns were erected from barges off the East River over a period of five consecutive nights. The building above the steel arches was constructed of reinforced concrete to meet the stringent vibration criteria required by sophisticated research laboratory equipment. The plan saved four months of construction and millions of dollars over the previous design. The Rockefeller University Research Building was an ACEC Grand National Award winner. 
And today, if you know to look for it, you can still see where the arch is located through the facade as you approach the building on the highway. The first green, environmentally responsible office building in New York, Four Times Square set new standards in every aspect of its conception and construction. In addition to photovoltaic panels, the building includes efficient energy, waste, and water management conservation systems. This $500 million project rises from a 44,000 square foot site nestled between West 42nd Street and Broadway. It is 48 stories high and com contains 1.6 million square feet of space that includes office, retail, and entertainment venues. Special consideration was given to the building's load because the Times Square shuttle tunnel cuts uh, across the southwest corner, making column placement very important. Four Times Square includes reinforced concrete foundations and a wind frame system that consists of structural steel bracing at the core. A 150 foot high telecommunication structure is integrated into the building to serve as an armature for satellite and microwave transmissions. I can say a lot about the 42nd Street renovation project, a redevelopment project that helped Mayor Giuliani turn the CD area into a 24-hour hotspot that it is today. But what got most press on that project at the time was certainly the relocation of the landmark Empire Theater. Our engineers conducted structural investigations for the restoration, renovation, and relocation of the Empire Theater, originally sitting right in the middle of the site. In order to make way for the redevelopment project, the theater's brick-bearing wall structure was jacked up, placed on rails, and moved to the westerly side of the site. The original Empire Theater now forms the new lobby and entrance leading up to and into the uh, high-rise movie theater and office complex. Trump World Tower, a $400 million, 880,000 square foot building, was the tallest concrete residential tower as well as the most slender high-rise building in the world when it was built. Located between 47th and 48th Street on 1st Avenue, the 70-story tower rises 860 feet above street level and has two underground levels. The tower footprint is rectangular with a 77 by 144 foot dimension. This provides a slenderness ratio of 11 to 1, which in combination with, it, with its height defines its principal engineering challenge. In order to minimize wind-induced acceleration, the tower was designed to utilize a tuned mass damper system. Now, it was the first building to implement a number two grade 80 steel as the primary reinforcement delivering structural efficiency and economic benefits. Designed to be the tallest building in Latin America, Torre Mayor is a 50-story first-class office tower that rises 225 meters above ground while having the ability to withstand Mexico's frequent seismic events. The tower superstructure utilizes the same shock absorbers used in the space shuttle strategically placed in a diamond pattern that absorbs the energy produced by an earthquake. The innovative configuration of the viscose damper-studded structure was awarded a U.S. patent. Designated by Popular Science Magazine as one of the 100 top tech innovations of 2003, the engineering achievement in this project exemplifies the great potential in the collaboration of engineering practice and research. In one of the worst seismic zones in the world, Torre Mayor is one of the world's safest buildings, achieved with an extremely cost-effective eff design. Time Warner Center is, in essence, seven separate buildings. There were at least seven architects with just one engineering firm. My father often said that the ordeal of managing a project like that was surely going to get him into heaven. I know you were right, Dad. But I'm sure it's because of your generosity, your charitable manner, and all of the good you did for others throughout your life. But 
I certainly recognize the challenge. The iconic structure at Columbus Circle in New York City contains approximately 2.1 million square feet spread over 54 floors. Rising 748 feet above the street, the building consists of two towers above a podium base. The multifunctional structure is composed of virtually seven stacked buildings, one on top of the other. Considering that each stacked building is independently owned and designed by a different architect, the structural system was selected to provide maximum flexibility for its users, a criterion also reflected in the construction materials chosen. In selecting the lateral system, the primary consideration was to find a system that would be totally independent of the supporting columns. This independence would permit the columns to adapt to the specific requirements of each of the stacked buildings. The solution, two concrete cores located under each tower, pierce the podium and extend from the ground up to transfer trusses located at the top of the podium. Sloped or split A shaped columns provide maximum space usage from the podium level to the lower levels. Some of you might know that uh, the optimist sees the glasses half full and the pessimist sees the glasses half empty, but the engineer, and this was certainly the case with my father, sees the glass as twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> Give you a minute. <laughs> the owners of Loft 2 in Miami uh, certainly benefited from this kind of thinking. Sophisticated innovations are often brought about by combining existing and uncomplicated techniques to achieve a genuinely elegant solution. Loft 2 was originally conceived as two buildings on either side of the Miami Metro Mover. The slenderness of two independent towers that would need to resist uh, hurricane, strong hurricane winds would substantially limit the height that they could be built to. In addition, the required setbacks would result in the loss of valuable usable area and reduce the amount of saleable units. Israel suggested building a single, much larger building by creating a structure that would bridge over the 70-foot span over the metro mover. The developers were not interested, knowing that a transfer beam system would be too expensive for an affordable building. Israel convinced them that the transfer beam was unnecessary and that our solution would, would be uncomplicated as well as economical. We designed a work platform that would protect the metro mover while at the same time allowing for a largely conven conventional erection of the structure. During its entire construction, the Metro Mover's operations were never interrupted. And that platform was eventually incorporated into the structure of the building. The main feature of this residential high-rise building is the pickup system over the Metro Mover, which was developed within the three levels immediately above the station. This straightforward solution allowed for a taller 35-story building to be erected with a substantially larger inventory of saleable units. One of the most slender buildings, uh, building structures in the world is 785 8th Avenue. It boasts a slenderness ratio of 15 to 1, maximum ratio 18 to 1 on its east end. Designing such a tall, thin building on an extremely narrow site while maximizing the use of space was the biggest feat achieved by the 785 team. In this building, concrete is utilized to its full advantage providing stiffness, weight, and damping that are essential in designing not only for strength and stability, but also for acceptable perception of motion. MET Complex is a four-phase project. Our firm completed the design of MET 3, uh, the, the 74-story residential tower, which given the category five wind conditions in Miami uh, was quite challenging. Uh, unfortunately, that part of the project is currently on hold. The MET 2 hotel and office building is currently under construction. An interesting structural feature is the two-story one, uh, I'm sorry, two-story 18,000 square foot column-free ballroom on the third floor of the podium. 
Six two-story, 110-foot span steel transfer trusses at levels five and six support 16 levels of parking and mechanical rooms above the ballroom. The lobbies for both the office and hotel are also housed in the podium with the hotel pool, spa, and fitness center and a regulation basketball court at the 19th level, a nod to one of its owners, Shaquille O'Neal. For MET2, Israel presented the new 97-thread bar system to the Miami Department of Buildings, persuading them to allow the use of the new high-strength reinforcing steel. Miami became the first city to allow it, and YAS was the first to use it. Among the iconic structures in Dubai, 014 is truly unique. It's, it's not that tall a building, but it truly is a jewel. Its perforated concrete tubular shell serves as its main architectural feature, its primary structural system, and environmentally smart brisole. The exoskeleton sunscreen wall features more than 1,300 openings of different sizes in, a, in an apparently random pattern that actually creates a diagonal grid to enable its use both as gravity and lateral, lateral support, allowing for column-free interior space. Completed through design development, Panorama City on the Danube, Danube River had been an exciting collaboration between uh, Israel and Spanish architect Ricardo Bofil. It is currently on hold. My father was once asked what his, famous, what his favorite building was. He said, Project, projects are like children. Some are very talkative, some are very smart, some are very playful. I can attest to the fact that he never showed favoritism among either his children or his grandchildren, and he had a special love for each one. His buildings enjoyed the same care. Some of his beloved projects were not necessarily the tallest ones. He was very proud of the firm's historic restoration work on Grand Central Station, a project that has now entered a new phase. He often talked about the post-tension retrofit that saved the crumbling old 1916 Cambridge garage just outside of Harvard. But without a doubt, the most playful building he ever designed was the gatehouse and visitor center dubbed the Monsta by Philip Johnson, who had willed his estate to the National Historic Trust. The only building either of them ever designed without formal design documents, it was not so much an engineer-client collaboration as two old friends playing in the sandbox. An eagle's nest tower was built for Philip to stand on while steel mesh was shaped and adjusted according to his direction. When he finally said, okay, that's it, Israel asked Philip, are you sure? No more changes once we start spraying on the concrete. Johnson gave the go-ahead, and the sculptural structure made entirely of angles and curves, no verticals, the only horizontal being the floor, was constructed using a system of steel mesh over insulation that was reinforced with rebar at the corners, sprayed with concrete, and finished with waterproof acrylic. My father's life's work and his professional accomplishments were numerous and impressive by any standard. He was constantly interviewed and quoted in trade publications as well as in the general press. He often appeared on television and in August of 2005 he was featured in Time Magazine's cover story, The 25 Most Influential Hispanics in America, recognizing his work in engineering high-rise buildings. He was particularly pleased with the placement of his picture on the cover right next to J-Lo. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sainuk shared his knowledge and his life experience for over 40 years as a professor of structures and head of the structures department at the Cooper Union School of Architecture. John Hajuk, the late dean of the school, said of him in 1999, when he first came to Cooper Union, we had a two-year structures program like most of the other architectural schools in the nation. Israel impacted. We now have a four-year structures program. As we all know, 
Israel is a determined man. Sometimes I hide from him when he has that fifth year structures program look in his eyes. His title of professor meant a great deal to him. He loved to teach and he loved his students and judging from the cards and letters sent to our family since his passing in the last few weeks and the amount of students that attended his students and alumni that attended his funeral, they, they loved him as well. Many recalled how much they had looked forward to and enjoyed the holiday dinner he would traditionally spring for in their graduating year. Many had wonderful stories to tell us about the profound effect he had on their lives. My father was a statuesque, sorry about that. My father was a statuesque, handsome, and imposing figure. And all my life I was inspired and to a large extent awed by him. Tough but fair, his high standards were always accompanied by sincere and paternal warmth with a pinch of humor. It was the tone he set at home, and that's how he ran his company, Israel Asenuk PC. He took as much pride in his YAS family for individual and collective accomplishments as, he's, as he did in his own children's success. Above all, he was a wonderful and loving husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. He taught by example. I'm so proud to be the daughter of a man who accomplished so much and touched so many lives. He often told my mother, Fanny, who is here with us today, not bad for a poor little cubanito from Luyano. He will always be sorely missed. Thank you.